anyone is interested in any of the details, the software, the data sets, or getting in touch with me, this is the website where um, everything is. And so what we're going to talk about uh, is the opportunities around uh, bioelectricity and in general around cellular collective intelligence in biorobotics, regenerative medicine, and so on. So uh, the design challenge that uh, we have is can be summed up as the total rational control of growth and form. And what I mean by that is that if we had the ability to tell groups of cells what to build in terms of three-dimensional anatomical structure, uh, many medical problems, in fact, most medical problems would go away. So birth defects, regeneration after traumatic injury would be possible. Cancer could be reprogrammed, aging, degenerative disease. So, and not only uh, bio, uh, biomedical uh, kind of um, problems, but also uh, synthetic biomorphology. So not just uh, reprogramming individual cells, but actually programming uh, a large scale shape and structure. And also actually non-neuromorphic um, AI would become possible. And so uh, all, all of these things boil down to one problem. How do we communicate our uh, morphological goals to a group of cells? And here I have to do disclosures because um, I'm involved in three different uh, spin-offs uh, from my lab, which I'm happy to talk about afterwards. So, so Morphoceuticals, Astonishing Labs, and Fauna Systems. Um, now, uh, the solution to these problems we call uh, the anatomical compiler. So the idea is that some, at some point in the future, you will be able to sit down in front of a, a computer and draw the animal or plant that you would like to have. So you would draw the three-dimensional structure, the anatomy, not the molecular biology of it, but actually the anatomy of what you want. And this system would, de would, would, would compile that anatomical description into a set of stimuli that would have to be given to cells to get them to build whatever you want. And in this case, here's this like three-headed flatworm. I'll show you some flatworms in a minute. So now uh, the th the, there are two, two really important pieces to this. One is that this is not a 3D printer. Uh, yeah, the point is not to micromanage the position of every cell and try to assemble something complex piece by piece. It is also not anything to do with genomic editing or CRISPR or anything like that. This is fundamentally the right way to think about this is as a communications device. This system um, and the AI that will make it possible is uh, for translating our anatomical and, and functional goals to the goals of a collective intelligence of cells that are going to build this thing. Now, we don't have anything remotely like that. We can only do this sort of thing in very few specific cases, but I wanted to lay out the, the opportunity I had. This is the kind of the roadmap. So um, one of the, so, so why don't we have this, you know, with genetics and, and molecular biology have been doing great over for decades. Why, why don't we have an anatomical compiler? Well, uh, let's just remind ourselves that we all start life as a group of cells and these embryonic blastomeres uh, reliably build something like this. So this is a cross section through a human torso. You can see the uh, incredible complexity of all the tissues, organs. So everything is in the right place and relative to each other. And so um, the question is, where does this shape come from? Where is this order stored? Where is it recorded? And uh, you, you might think, well, the genome, the thing that every, everything's in the genome, but, but actually we can read genomes now and we know what's in the genome. What the genome encodes is the tiny, uh, uh, protein hardware, the molecular hardware that every cell gets to have. There's nothing directly in the genome that says anything about size, shape, uh, the number of organs, the types of organs. And so the fundamental uh, scientific challenge here is to understand how this group of, um, of cells exploits that hardware to build something reliably. How do they know when to stop? Why do cells sometimes defect from this plan and then that, that results in cancer? And then as, as, uh, as the workers in regenerative medicine, we'd like to know if something is missing, how do you convince the cells to regrow it? And if, um, uh, if as engineers, we would like to say, well, what else can these cells build? Okay, is there, is there is, with, with a standard genome, can you get the exact same hardware to build something completely different? Um, and so these are the, these are the questions that, uh, that, uh, that face us. Now, I want to show an extremely simple example to remind us why genetic information is not enough. So this is uh, the larva of, a, of an axolotl. So baby axolotls have little forelegs. This is a tadpole and uh, baby frogs at this point do not have legs. So in my lab, we can make something called a frogolotl. So what's a frogolotl? Well, it's a chimeric embryo that's part uh, cells from an axolotl, part cells from a frog. And now I can ask a very simple question. Well, we have both genomes. So the axolotl genome has been sequenced. The frog genome has been sequenced. Could anybody tell me whether frogolotls are going to have legs or not? And the answer is no. There is no existing model that will go from genomic information to being able to predict anatomy in cases like this. In fact, even, even within a single organism, we can't go from the genome to a description of what the anatomy is going to be without cheating, basically comparing that genome to something where you already know what it is. And so, so there's this fundamental disconnect between the molecular hardware 
and uh, the large scale anatomical decision making of the collective of cells that's going to decide to build this large scale structure, possibly involving cells from from uh, from the frog. Uh, but 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 this is this is this is the frontier. The frontier is understanding how large scale collective decisions are being made in, that determine our anatomy and our uh, and our function. Now the bad news is that uh, by themselves, these very important technologies such as genomic editing and molecular biology are not going to give us everything that we want because this process of going from a single cell egg to one of these uh, complex bodies is uh, this 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 morphogenetic process is incredibly complex and recurrent. In other words, all of these cells are doing various things, and together there's uh, they, they end up building something like this, but reversing this is extremely hard. To give you a very simple example um, from, uh, for example, the fractals, this is a simple mathematical formula. It's very short, very simple. If you iterate it and plot the and plot the, the, uh, the uh, kind of a, a, a version of the Julia set, you will get this very complex pattern. But now, and, and so that's great. Going forward is easy. Going, starting with the rules and getting something complex is very simple. But going backwards, if I, if, if you were a worker in regenerative medicine, you said, well, this thing isn't quite symmetrical. And by the way, I don't want three of these. I want four. How would you have to change the formula? Um, it's, there is no, uh, there's no way to, to do that. This is an intractable inverse problem. And so uh, figuring out what you would have to change on the molecular or genetic level to make large scale changes and repairs is extremely difficult. It'll be possible for some cases, but it needs to be complemented with a, a top down approach. Now, here's, here's where we are today. Uh, we're very good as a community in manipulating molecules and cells, and there are amazing uh, kinds of advances all the time in terms of synthetic biology and, and protein engineering and, and, and things like this. We're actually still a very a long way away from control of large scale form and function. Uh, injuries, cancer, birth defects, these things are largely yet not addressable. And I think that's because we are still uh, fundamentally in, in, in molecular uh, medicine somewhere uh, here. This is where uh, you know, computer science was in the 40s and 50s, where in order to reprogram the machine, you have to physically interact with the hardware, right? You have to, you have to physically rewire. And this is, this is where all the excitement is today. So, so um, gene regulatory circuits, uh, novel, uh, novel molecular um, interactions and so on. But, but in addition to that, we have the opportunity to do something amazing, which is to take advantage of the high level information processing, AKA intelligence in the layers of biology. Now, when I say intelligence, I don't mean, and this is this is the good news, is that we have now opportunities to do this. I don't mean a human level, second order, I know that I know, and that, that kind of thing. I mean something else that might be at different locations along this continuum. This is this, this sort of continuum is due to um, Norbert Wiener and, uh, and colleagues. And, and William James defined intelligence as the ability to reach the same goal by different means. And so um, I don't have time to show you too many examples, but I'll show you a few. Biology uh, is really good at this. And what we now have the opportunity to do is to use AI as a kind of translator between us and this robust intelligence of cells and tissues that are navigating something we call morphospace. Morphospace is simply the space of all, it's a, it's a virtual space of all possible uh, morphogenetic outcomes or anatomical outcomes. And so we have the ability to, uh, uh, to, to control how the, uh, the living system navigates that morphospace. And it's possible because uh, biology, unlike most of our technology, I, I sometimes give a different talk called why robots don't get cancer. And, and the, reason, the reason that biology is so special, um, and there's no reason why we couldn't um, emulate this, is that it uses a multi-scale competency architecture. The idea is that at every level, right, so from molecular networks to, uh, to, to cells, to tissues, to whole bodies, whether in behavioral space or anatomical space, uh, or even uh, collectives, each of these layers solves its own problems. They are not just uh, structural, they are um, problem solving systems that operate or navigate in the space of gene expression, the space of uh, physiology, the space of anatomy, and of course, the three dimensional behavioral space, in our case, also linguistic spaces and so on. And they all have different levels of sophistication and different competencies to do this. But the key is that rewiring them physically is not the only game in town. We also have the opportunity because their intelligence is uh, higher than uh, than than um, a simple hardwired uh, clockworks. We have the opportunity to communicate with them, to reset their set points, and to uh, have various other kinds of uh, interesting interactions with them. So the thing to recall is that fundamentally we are all collective intelligences. There's no such thing as an indivisible kind of um, uh, some, some some sort of indivisible diamond of intelligence. We are all made of parts, and the parts that we are made of 
are individual cells. Now here's a cell, this happens to be a free living organism known as a lacrimaria, one cell. There's no brain, there's no nervous system. This thing is incredibly competent at very local, uh, tiny little goals, metabolic, um, uh, physiological, and other uh, kinds of states. You can see it here, feeding in the environment. Anybody who's into soft robotics uh, should be drooling at this. We don't have anything remotely like this level of control. And again, just one cell. Um, and it, it is made of molecular networks that also have all kinds of competencies. For example, uh, the gene regulatory circuits and pathways inside cells are capable of at least six different kinds of learning, including associative conditioning. And this is, this is all without changing their structure at all. So this is not about rewiring uh, uh, GRNs with experience, gene regulatory networks through experience. This is in, in situ exactly how they are. They're capable of, of learning. So um, this, this, uh, this multi-scale architecture of competency, meaning that we are made of uh, cells that used to be independent organisms and didn't drop all their intelligence when they joined together means that we have lots of different uh, uh, competencies in morphogenetic space. So for example, when you take an early embryo, let's say a human embryo, and you cut it into halves or quarters, you don't get uh, uh, two um, half bodies, you get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins because each half uh, can recognize that the other half is missing and rebuild what it needs. In fact, you can think of embryonic development as a kind of regeneration of the entire body from just one cell. And so there's this ability of different, uh, different uh, systems, you know, here's the normal embryo, here's the embryo cut in half and so on, the ability of different systems to navigate this space to reach the ensemble of goal states that we associate with normal, uh, normal uh, target morphology or normal anatomy for that species. And in fact, in many cases, go, going around avoiding various local maxima that would trap a um, less intelligent system. So this is one example of regulative development. Um, here's another example, uh, a, a creature like this. This is an axolotl, and these guys regenerate their legs, their eyes, their jaws, uh, their portions of their heart and brain, um, their ovaries, spinal cord, and so on. And what they do is if you, if you amputate, um, and in fact, they, they bite each other's legs off all the time, so this is a natural experiment that, that keeps happening, uh, they, you, you, can, you can amputate anywhere along this line, and the cells will very rapidly build exactly what's needed uh, and then they stop. Now, this is the most amazing part of this whole process, right? Is that is that not only does it regenerate no matter where you cut it from, it makes exactly what's needed, no more, no less, but that it ever stops. How does it know when to stop? It stops when a correct salamander arm has been completed. So this now tells you that this kind of thing is a uh, some sort of a, a, a navigation policy in this in this anatomical space. It's a it's an error minimization scheme where um, errors like this become corrected over time, and when the error is small enough, then and they stop. So we really need to understand this ability, this ability to navigate. So all the tools of uh, autonomous, uh, uh, you know, um, self-driving uh, various vehicles and, and all of this the kind of control theory stuff from uh, from from uh, uh, engineering and AI becomes becomes very relevant here. Now, this is not just for uh, salamanders and worms. I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, mammals do this, too. So humans regenerate their livers. Uh, human children regenerate their fingertips up to up until a certain age. So if you just leave it alone, a, an amputated fingertip actually becomes cosmetically a very nice finger. And deer are a large adult mammal that regrows uh, uh, basically uh, meters of, of of new bone vasculature innervation and so on. Uh, and and it does it every year, and it does it at a rate of about a centimeter and a half of new bone per day. So it is not the case that uh, mammals are somehow. Um, uh, uh, unable to regenerate, but, but our capacities at, at present, and I, and I do think this is changeable, are uh, uh, not as good as those of, of certain other um, organisms. Now, we've been studying for some years how it is that this happens. How does a collection of cells know what to build and when to stop? And we took our inspiration from the nervous system, which is basically a collection of cells that uh, guide your body through uh, behavioral space using, using memories and goals and so on. Exactly the same thing, uh, it turns out, happens in anatomical space. So the way it happens in the brain is that the hardware looks like this. It's a bunch of uh, cells we call neurons. They're electrically active, and so they have these little ion channels uh, in, that, um, in their membrane that set a voltage. That voltage sometimes is co uh, communicated to their neighbors through these gap junctions or these uh, electrical synapses. And so there's this network and there's this physiology. So here it is, this group um, imaged all the electrical activity of a living zebrafish brain as zebrafish are thinking about whatever it is that zebrafish normally think about. And so you can see, and you can see all this activity and it's the commitment of neuroscience that all of the cognitive activity, the goals, the preferences, the memories, the behavioral repertoires of this animal are in this 
physiological activity. If only we could decode it. So there's this, there's this notion of neural decoding where you can scan a brain, decode it somehow and figure out what the animal is thinking about or looking at. And there's been some success in this, both in, in humans and, and in model systems. Um, the amazing thing is that uh, brains and neurons didn't uh, learn this trick on their own or didn't invent it uh, from scratch. This is something that uh, living systems have been doing since the time of bacterial biofilms. Uh, back if all, already that long ago, evolution discovered that electrical networks are amazing at storing and processing information. So every cell in your body has these ion channels and figuring out what is a neuron and what isn't is actually not uh, trivial at all. Uh, most cells are connected to their neighbors with these electrical synapses. And what you can do is you can look at early embryos or regenerating limbs or anything else using the same techniques, uh, being, being basically elect um, uh, electrical imaging, and try to do the same decoding program. You could ask, could we learn to decode to understand what the cells are saying to each other, and then to rewrite those patterns and get them to build something else? And this is what this is what we've been working on. So I want to show you very quickly um, just two examples of, uh, of of these bioelectrical patterns. This is a uh, using a voltage sensitive fluorescent dye. So so here the grayscale colors represent a voltage of the cells. This is a time lapse movie of an early frog embryo putting its face together. Now, one thing you'll note, this is a frame, one, one frame out of that movie, we call this the electric face. Why? Because already before the genes come on that are going to pattern this whole structure, already you can see this is where the eye is going to be, this is where the mouth is going to be, the, the, the animal's left eye comes in later. This is the, um, uh, the placodes out to the side that give rise to all kinds of tissues. Already you can read the electrical pattern memory that's going to guide what happens next. I'm going to show you in a minute why, why this, why, how, how we know that this is actually a, an instructive set of interactions. But this is a normal pattern. This is, this is required for normal development. This is a pathological pattern. So here we've injected a human oncogene into an embryo. Eventually it's going to make a tumor. Eventually the tumor will metastasize. But already using this voltage dye, you can see what's going on here. You can see that these cells are electrically decoupling from their neighbors. They're acquiring a weird depolarized membrane potential, and they're just going to um, uh, uh, roll back to their amoeba lifestyle and, and migrate and, uh, and treat the rest of the body as external environment. So, um, so, so that's how we read these patterns, and we've developed tools to rewrite these patterns. And we don't use, there's, there are no electrodes, no applied fields, no waves, no frequencies. What we do is we exploit the native interface by which the cells are normally hacking each other's behavior, which is these ion channels that are on each other on their surface um, and these gap junctions that allow them to talk to each other. So we have ways mostly appropriated from, from neuroscience using, using optogenetics and, and drugs and so on to open and close uh, these channels and to control the topology of the network. And so when you do this, what you can do is we can induce whole organs. So we can induce inner ears. This is, this is all in the frog model right now I'm showing you. Inner ears, we can induce hearts, ectopic beating hearts. We can induce forebrain. So here's, here's where the forebrain normally stops in this tadpole here. We've, we've made this, this extra large uh, forebrain. We can make extra limbs. So here's our, our five and, uh, and six-legged frogs. And we can make some structures that don't even belong on this animal, like fins. And there's a whole story that I don't have time to tell you today about changing the actual shape of an animal to a different species without uh, changing the genome. And we have several stories about that. So um, one of the amazing things uh, about this is that these changes can be permanent because we're dealing with a uh, tissue level intelligence that has memory. So when we take this flatworm, so here's a flatworm, it's got a head and a tail, and we amputate the tail, we amputate the head, we leave just the middle fragment. So this middle fragment will normally regenerate 100% of the time they make a normal worm, one head, one tail. And we ask the question, how do they know? How do they know how many heads they're supposed to have? And we found this electrical gradient that says one head, one tail. We change that gradient to say actually two heads. And so what you get is this, this two-headed worm. And this is not Photoshop. These are real. You can see the you can see the video. These two-headed worms uh, in their um, kind of spare time, what they're doing, and uh, and the amazing thing is that once you've got this two-headed worm, that that's it. From then on, if you amputate the primary head, you amputate this this ectopic secondary head. This middle fragment will continue to 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 regrow two heads. The genetics are untouched. We never did any genomic editing here. There's no transgenes, no 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 new circuits, no synthetic biology, nothing. All we did was a very brief physiological stimulus that rewrites the pattern memory. This is literally the way that, the way that people um, read the memories of a, of a brain by looking at the electrical activity. We can now read the memories of the collective intelligence of 
the body. And so what we can see is that once you've rewritten what the system uh, encodes as the correct morphology, well, it will continue to build this new morphology, uh, as far as we can tell, um, for forever. And that we now also have a way of changing them back to be one-headed. Now, I'm going to show you one other one other uh, uh, example, uh, and then we'll get to the some of the um, biomedical stuff and the biorobotics. So, so this this has to do with uh, organ level induction. So, so we can we can inject. Um, uh, certain ion channel RNAs that will induce, for example, we can we can copy that eye spot that I showed you in the the, the electric face. We can put it anywhere in the body. So if we put it on the gut, these gut cells happily make an eye, and this eye has all the right lens and retina and optic nerve and all of that stuff. But notice notice a couple of interesting things. One is that we didn't have to put in all the information about how to make an eye. In fact, we don't have any idea of how to make an eye. What we do know is that there's a high level subroutine call that says to the local cells make an eye and then all the stuff downstream all the all the morphogenesis all the gene expression all the gradients everything else is taken care of the other thing so so that's so that's really a really attractive property is this this um this this modularity but the other thing is that there are other hidden competencies here for example this is a lens sitting out in the flank of a tadpole somewhere and the blue cells are the ones that we injected with this potassium channel and so they go to make an eye but there's not enough of them there's only a few of them so what do they do? They recruit a bunch of their normal cells, which are not blue. That's how you know we have not manipulated manipulated them. And these 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 brown and clear cells participate because these cells hijack them. They recruit them towards this goal. This is the mark of a good collective intelligence, like ants and uh, and termites. When there's a task that's too big for for the individuals that uh, that, uh, that that have started on it, they will recruit their their neighbors to all work together. So again, we didn't have to orchestrate any of this. This is already there. This competency is already in the tissue. So discovering these subroutines and discovering the various competencies and the abilities of, of these networks to restore the correct uh, structure and function uh, with minimal intervention, with minimal um, tweaks is the, is the name of the game here. And so moving to the, uh, to the regenerative part. So uh, in a frog, unlike salamander, if it loses a leg uh, 45 days later, there's nothing. Although interestingly, once you do the amputation, the opposite leg lights up bioelectrically within 30 seconds, it lights up at exactly the location where the damage took place. So the whole body knows about this. And you can think about this as surrogate site diagnostics and things like this. Um, uh, already, you can read out where the damage was. Now, what we did was we came up with a, um, uh, a cocktail of ion channel drugs that induces regeneration. So here are the pro-regenerative genes come on. Within 45 days, you've already got some toes, you've got a toenail, eventually you have a very nice leg and it's touch sensitive and it's motile. And what, what we found is that one day, so 24 hours of a wearable bioreactor made by David Kaplan's lab uh, with the right um, payload gives you 18 months, a year and a half of leg growth, during which time we don't touch it at all. So this is not about 3D printing. This is not about micromanaging what the stem cells do. It is about convincing the cells at the very beginning that they're going to go down the regenerative route and not the scarring route. And that's it. After that, you don't, you don't touch it again. So we are now, this is, uh, this is uh, our efforts through Morphoceuticals. Again, uh, David Kaplan and I are co-founders. And uh, what we're what we're using is that we're now in in, uh, in mammals and we're attempting to do this in in mice uh, right now with uh, a re with a bioreactor that that uh, controls the, the the wound environment and then it's got a payload of of drugs that try to convince the cells that they need to regenerate. So um, there are also applications to cancer. Uh, I showed you this picture a minute ago. Once you start thinking about this as these electrical networks as a way of uh, creating a larger scale. Um, system that can pursue large goals like building nice organs instead of little tiny amoeba level goals of proliferate and migrate, then what we can do is we can artificially reconnect these cells when when the when the oncogene tells them to disconnect we can we can force them to be in the right electrical state and so you see here the oncogene is labeled in red this is the same animal there's uh, tons of it right and so if you were to sequence this you would see that there's a, a nasty KRAS mutation or something like that. And you would say, ah, there has to be a tumor there. And in fact, there is no tumor because what we've also done is co-inject an ion channel that forces these cells into electrical communication with their neighbors, does not let them detach. So there's a, there's a cancer therapeutics um, uh, thing here. Okay, so the last, the last bit I wanna show you in the last couple of minutes, um, I wanna show you some, uh, some, synthetic, uh, some synthetic life. So um, we call these xenobots uh, because they come from uh, the, the skin cells of, of the frog called Xenopus labus, and we think this is a biorobotics platform. And this is a collaboration between Josh Fongard at the University of uh, Vermont and myself. 
So um, Doug Blackiston is the biologist who does uh, this work in my group. Um, Sam Friedman was Josh's student who does the programming. And what you see here is this thing swimming along. This is a piece of, uh, 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 this is this, this, this uh, proto-organism uh, self-assembled from cells taken off, scraped off of an early embryo. These are just skin. Again, there's no neurons here, there's no brain. Um, this is what the skin will do uh, when left to its own devices, when, ex when, when freed basically from the instructive influence of the other cells. And you can see what happens here. They can move in circles, they can patrol back and forth like this. These are all spontaneous behaviors. They have um, collective behaviors, they can interact with each other, they can sort of go on these longer journeys. There's great individuality here among them. Um, and what you're looking at is, is, is the answer to the question, what would skin cells do if given a chance to reboot their multicellularity, taken away from uh, these other cells? Now, here's one navigating a maze. Uh, you can see what it's doing. It's uh, swimming here, um, takes the corner without bumping into the opposite wall. And then here, for some internal reason, it decides to turn around and go back where it came from. Okay, again, completely sp spontaneous. This is and, and, and this, uh, these, these, these uh, xenobots have all kinds of calcium activity, which you would normally see in the brain, but again, no neurons, just skin. And one of the most remarkable things about this is that we can now, uh, we can now use AI to uh, control their, uh, their behavior. So, so here, what you're seeing here is um, these, this, this white stuff out here, these, these little particles, these are other skin cells, just loose skin cells that we provided them with. And um, what we did, uh, the, so, so what, what Josh and Sam did was, was to do a bunch of simulations that showed us that if we make this, this little Pac-Man shape, they become really, really good at this task. So what they do is they collect the cells, they sort of um, push them together into a little ball and, uh, and, they, and they polish that little ball. And because they're dealing with an agential material, meaning the cells are not passive particles, they have agendas, they, they like to do certain things. Once they're pushed into this ball, that thing matures into the next generation of xenobots. And guess what they do? They run around and do the same thing, although not quite as well as the first generation. And so uh, there's a few things we, we learn from this. One is that uh, we can use now AI to begin, and this is just the very beginning, we can use AI to begin to control the native behaviors, the very rich native repertoire, very surprising repertoire that nobody had any idea that skin cells can uh, sort of implement von Neumann's dream, a robot that goes around and builds copies of itself um, from loose material it finds in, in, in the environment. But there are these, there are these amazing competencies and uh, the research program now and the roadmap is to learn to recognize them and then to learn to control them and reprogram them for applications in regenerative medicine, robotics, and ultimately to take what we learn from the intelligence of these cells and use them to create uh, uh, new, new artificial intelligences. And so because biology is so incredibly interoperable, they find, biology finds a way to um, uh, live coherently under so many circumstances. In the future, almost any combination of evolved natural material, designed material, and software at whatever scale is some viable creature. And so I think in the future, we are going to be surrounded by uh, all kinds of hybrids and cyborgs and, and, and um, chimeras and all kinds of things, uh, which are going to require a new kind of ethics for relating to beings that are nowhere on the normal tree of life with us. In other words, we cannot use familiar uh, criteria of where did you come from, meaning evolved or designed, and what are you made of, meaning do you have a brain, does it look human, that kind of thing. Those criteria are going to be out the window. Everything that Darwin uh, meant when he said endless forms most beautiful are a tiny corner in this enormous option space of possible bodies and possible minds. And so um, I will just end with this by saying that uh, there's some there's some very deep uh, uh, new ideas coming in uh, in the space of biomedical interventions uh, rooted in this kind of uh, kind of idea by um, uh, Fabrizio Benedetti, who studies uh, uh, placebo effects, which is that really what you have here is the is the role of top down cognitive information on molecular events. You do that every time you get out of, up out of bed every morning, you, you, you know, your intention, your mental intention of getting up feeds down into the molecular properties of your muscle cell membranes that make you get up. And so, so the idea, especially using uh, bioelectricity as this transduction layer, that software layer between the intelligence and the, the actual execution machinery and, uh, and AI to actually, uh, to actually manage this gives us a whole range of, of strategies here that are in complement to uh, all the all the successful um, kind of uh, mainstream strategies. So um, that's it. Um, just to summarize what I've said, 
Uh, the rate limiting step in truly transformative technologies are the communication of goals to cellular swarms, not just the, uh, not just the molecular details, but actually the algorithms of life. Uh, and uh, we have a roadmap for exploiting the native computation and the competencies of living networks. Bioelectrical signaling is a really crucial um, protocognitive medium of that collective intelligence. And we now have tools that appropriate um, all kinds of deep concepts from neuroscience to help us understand this in other contexts. And at stake are um, a huge number of really transformative um, applications. And so I'll just, uh, I'll end here by uh, thanking the postdocs and the students who did all the work, um, uh, our funders, uh, and most of all, uh, the animal model systems, because they do all the heavy lifting. And then once again, um, there's some disclosures that I need to make. So thank you very much.